Our options for antimicrobial susceptibility testing have greatly increased in recent years. In addition to classical phenotypic susceptibility testing by disk diffusion and measurement of the minimum inhibitory concentration, genotypic tests are increasingly available. Genotypic tests range from tests for a single organism and one resistance gene to tests for 20 or more organisms and multiple resistance genes. But what should the clinical microbiologist do when the results of phenotypic and genotypic susceptibility testing are in conflict? Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm JCM Editor-in-Chief Alex McAdam. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. Joining me are two of the authors of a paper in press at JCM. Dr. Patricia Simner is an Associate Professor of Pathology at Johns Hopkins University and Director of Medical Bacteriology. Trish is a frequent guest on the podcast. You can follow Trish on Twitter at Simner Lab. Trish, welcome back to Editors in Conversation. Thanks for having me, Alex, and hello to all the listeners. We're also joined by Dr. Jennifer Dean Bard. Jen is the Director of Microbiology and Virology Laboratories at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and an Associate Professor of Pathology in the Department of Pathology at Keck School of Medicine of USC. You can also follow Jen on Twitter at Dean Bard. Jen, I'm delighted you could join us. Hi, Alex. Hi, Trish. I'm happy to be here. Hi, everyone. The paper we're going to discuss is titled The Genotype to Phenotype Dilemma. How should laboratories approach discordant susceptibility results? Dr. Rebecca Yee is the first author, but unfortunately, she was not able to join us today. The paper will be in the June issue of JCM, but it's available now on the journal's website under the Accepted Manuscripts tab. We'll also put a link to the manuscript in the show notes. Trish, let's start with you. Can you give us just a primer on the differences between genotypic and phenotypic susceptibility testing? Sure can. Um, so let's start out with phenotypic tests. So traditional phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility tests are growth-based tests. So you think of your disk diffusion, your microbot dilution, gradient diffusion, or automated systems. These systems detect growth or no growth of the organism in the presence of varying concentrations of an antimicrobial agent. We will then interpret those results applying clinical breakpoints and result them out as susceptible, susceptible, dose-dependent, intermediate, or resistant. So these tests are, are highly standardized and clinicians are, have become confident and reliant on these results due to decades of use. Phenotypic tests require pure culture growth of the organism. They're, they have overnight incubation and are independent of the resistant mechanism. So what do I mean by that? In other words, um, we're detecting the phenotype of resistance. So growth of an organism in a high concentration of an antimicrobial um, resulting in resi or being resulted as resistant. But we don't actually define the precise mechanism of resistance. Um, so you're just detecting that phenotype. Whereas with genotypic methods, you're applying molecular methods like PCR, uh, probe hybridization, or microarray techniques that detect the presence or absence of a specific antimicrobial resistance gene. The most commonly uh, used are syndromic-based multiplex panels that simultaneously identify an organism and detect some of the most consequential resistance genes directly from clinical specimens. So the presence and or absence of an antimicrobial resistance gene associated with a particular organism can be used to predict phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility results to more rapidly guide therapy. So if an AMR gene is present, it's assumed that the detection of that gene conveys resistance to specific antimicrobials. So in summary, phenotypic tests are kind of a broad uh, catch-all for detecting uh, the phenotype of resistance, whereas molecular tests target a specific resistance gene to detect, uh, to then predict resistance based off of that specific target or, or multiple targets. Thank you, Trish. That was very helpful. Uh, Jen, can you tell us a little bit about the advantages of phenotypic and genotypic testing? Sure, definitely. So I'll start with the advantages of the genotypic susceptibility testing. Um, so one major advantage is really the speed of the test. You know, for example, in the cases of blood cultures, you have a resistance marker that can be detected in about an hour from the time of positivity. So significantly faster when you're comparing it to your traditional phenotypic tests. 
Um, as in the case of some gram-positive organisms, such as Staph aureus, early confirmation of the presence or the absence of a resistance gene can allow clinicians to, to quickly tailor antimicrobial therapy. And this can be done completely independent of a phenotypic susceptibility result. Um, other advantages of genotypic testing is that it doesn't require live cells, which is, you know, which allows it to be really fast. Um, and it even doesn't really even require growth on an auger plate at all, which is ideal for patients who have already been, you know, treated with antimicrobials prior to specimen collection, mm -hmm. or if there's insufficient growth on the plate um, that prevents you from being able to set up a manual ASD. Um, on the other hand, end of the spectrum, you have phenotypic testing. And one benefit of that is that it, it really is the standard around what antimicrobial therapeutic plans are based. And if anything, providers are very comfortable with it. And this is despite the fact that it is it does have a snail-like speed compared to genotypic testing. Um, a huge advantage of phenotypic testing, though, is that it really is mechanism agnostic, where the test can, as Trish mentioned, it can really predict susceptibility to any drug, regardless of the mechanism at play. It is definitely more flexible in the sense that the methods can be used to test any drug. You're not dependent or restricted to just one single target. So definitely much more comprehensive. And then phenotypic testing by traditional method, I guess you can call it more personalized where you can directly, you know that you're directly testing each isolate of interest. So the result that comes out, you know directly pertains to that particular isolate. With genotypic testing, the resistance marker that is detected may not necessarily be linked to a particular bug. So this can be an issue in cases of polymicrobial infection. So for example, if you have a blood culture that's growing both a staph aureus and a coagnate staph, and you have MECA detected, um, the genotypic tests that are available right now will not allow you to, to will not assign that MECA directly to that particular bug. So, and you know, in fact, there are some cases where you wouldn't actually be able to tell that there is a polymicrobial infection at play. It would just indicate that there is, for example, a staph aureus or staph species present. Um, and then finally, uh, phenotypic testing and the ability to offer, for example, an MIC value really allows for you know more tailoring or nuances in interpretation. So, for example, if you have a carbapenemase producing Klebsiella that is resistant, but with an MIC of say four, you know, providers may still consider it to be a part of the treatment regimen, particularly in scenarios where there are limited therapeutic options. And with a genotypic result, you wouldn't be able to kind of tailor to that, to that particular patient or the isolate. You, you, you referred to the speed of phenotypic testing as snail-like, which I agree with. Um, <laughs> can you walk us through a patient specimen comes into the laboratory on Monday, um, and let's say it's from a wound and there's staph aureus in the sample. When is that susceptibility result going to come out if it's a phenotypic test? So if it's a phenotypic test and if it's done um, using traditional methods, so, you know, you it takes about 18, 20, 18 to 24 hours for it to grow, for you to work it up. Um, with most places having MALDI, the identification is fortunately quite fast. But then you're setting up susceptibilities, which can take, you know, another, depending on the system, another 10 to 24 hours before you get that second result for susceptibility. So in total, up, up to 48 hours, if all works out well. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the advantages and disadvantages, I heard a lot, and I was pretty sold on phenotypic testing, except for the speed. <laughs> is, there, is there an advantage to genotypic testing besides the speed, which is important? And I, I don't mean to minimize it at all, but it seems like that's the big player. I mean, definitely the speed. I think the fact that you can test for a resistance marker, especially when um, for organisms that are more fastidious mm. or you just aren't able to recover, I think that's where it can be extremely helpful. You know, we, we're seeing it now even with, for example, gonorrhea, where um, it's really difficult to recover the organism for susceptibilities. But, you know, to be able to detect a resistance marker can tell you a lot about therapy. Got it. So difficult to grow organisms are another advantage for genotypic testing. I, mm -hmm. 
I can add to that as well. Yeah, um, you know, and knowing the precise um, enzyme sometimes is helpful in terms of treatment or the gene, sorry, not enzyme when it's molecular, the gene present is helpful in terms of treatment as well. Um, if you think about carbapenemases and the novel beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, knowing the specific carbapenemase can help you in um, treating, in um, determining what treatment options are available. So if you have a KPC producer, Producer, you can use ceftazavi or meropenem vibrobactam, but if it is a metallobeta-lactamase producer like NDM, then you know those, those agents won't be active and you need to start thinking of other options for therapy like cefidrocol or, or other um, antimicrobial agent therapy. And so I, I do think there are some additional benefits to knowing the specific mechanism in terms of uh, treatment guidance as well. Oh, excellent. You guys have expanded my horizons. Uh, <laughs> Trish, the article focused on what labs should do if there's a discrepancy between genotypic and phenotypic results. Why would such a discrepancy occur? Well, there are actually many possibilities to why discordant and uh, phenotype to genotype results can occur. Um, I kind of break them down into four categories, uh, growth-based issues. So you might have a mixed culture or a mis organism um, not being identified appropriately. Alternatively, you could have reagent or instrument in, in, instrument issues that lead to um, these discrepancies. So you can have a module or instrumentation issue that causes a false positive result or reagents that are contaminated with nucleic acid that can lead to a false positive result on your molecular panels that don't align with your phenotypic results. You could have uh, clerical or transcriptional errors, uh, which is the third ca category. So especially if you don't have it directly interfaced and you're taking your uh, uh, reports from your uh, molecular panel printout and then incorporating those into the LIS, you can have a, a kind of a keystroke miss and all of a sudden your E. coli has a, a NDM gene that it didn't, that it wasn't supposed to be reported. So uh, all things that need to be looked into. And then the last category, which is the more complex category, is more the mechanistic based issues. And um, we divide those into two types of dis discrepancies. One is the absence of a resistance gene, but the presence of phenotypic resistance. And in most scenarios, the most likely uh, um, case leading to this is the fact that it's an off target AMR mechanism. Like if you're looking at third generation cephalosporin resistance and the CTXM gene, the SBL gene target is negative, you know, third generation cephalosporin resistance can be mediated by many other mechanisms, other ESBLs, inducible AMPC, a combination of, you know, a narrow spectrum beta-lactamase, hyperexpression and porin. So, um, so, you know, those those um, types of discrepancies can often be, um, you know, figured out by just by off target mechanisms being the explanation for the discrepancy. On the flip side, this is when you detect a resistance gene, but your discordant is your phenotypic results that that are susceptible to the agents that you would predict to be resistance with that gene gets a little bit more complex where you might have detection of a gene, but the lack or poor expression. So you are not actually detecting that phenotype that you normally associate with that gene on uh, culture. You can have, again, your mixed population where, um, you know, you, you don't realize that there's a, another organism present and low burden, you know, in that primary inoculum of your plate and you missed it. Or hetero resistance where you have, um, you know, pure culture of Klebsiella pneumoniae, but a subpopulation that harbors the plasmid and then the other population uh, no longer harbors that plasmid. And so you might select the more susceptible subpopulation on subculturing in the absence of selective pressure. Um, or even just the complete loss of a plasmid and the lack of selective pressure on, on subcultures to try to set up your phenotypic AST. So again, there's four kind of main categories that I look at is the first is just culture based, really, you know, simple. Do, or do you have a pure culture or not? Is it mixed? You know, work it up separately. If it's mixed, go from there look into reagent instrument issues, look at reporting issues. And then the last kind of more complex scenario is trying to figure out any type of mechanistic uh, base differences or um, issues with um, expression versus, um, you know, um, just detecting a gene. So 
Thank you, Trish. Jen, how do you think that the clinical providers view genotypic and, and phenotypic results? Do they see one of these as more reliable than the other? So, th so that's a great question. And I'm sure every clinical microbiologist that have implemented some sort of genotypic test has had to address this in their institution. Um, because phenotypic testing has really been, you know, the mainstay of antimicrobial susceptibility testing for decades, definitely clinicians are more comfortable with reviewing that result. So, you know, they like to see that S for susceptible or that R for resistant, you know, with or without the MIC value. Um, and then there are also providers that have may have minimal molecular experience or really minimal understanding of the resistance mechanism. And with that, it makes them more hesitant to trust that an isolate is susceptible based purely on the absence of a gene. So, for example, if in the absence of a MEC gene, you know, we're telling them it's methicillin susceptible staph aureus. And, you know, they just not being able to detect the gene and having to kind of tailor therapy based on that can make a can make them uncomfortable. And so they may opt to maintain vancomycin therapy until uh, the traditional phenotypic results are available. Um, I think, though, that, you know, from the reliability standpoint, they tend to be more willing to trust a result when a resistance gene is detected than when it is not. But this, I think this can really be mitigated, though, with thorough and continuous education, you know, proven data from published literature. But what's really helpful is to show them data from your own institution mm -hmm. to prove that the result is trustworthy, you know, incorporating um, like guidance through comments, et cetera, and, and not just reporting out detected or not detected. Um, for example, in our institution, we took a more stepwise approach about nine years ago when implementing a molecular blood culture paddle. Uh, we first were a bit more cautious with interpretive comment. We reported out MSSA presumptive, MECA not detected. But then after some time and after generating enough data to demonstrate high accuracy, we were confident to remove the presumptive word. And that word alone, removing it made a huge difference in how it was interpreted by the clinicians. So reporting out just MSSA, comma, MECA not detected. And now, you know, years later, providers at our institution are very comfortable with the results, um, whether it be absence or presence of the resistance marker. Thank you, Jen. Who, who did you work with in deciding to remove the word um, preliminary or, uh, sorry, was it preliminary? What was it? Presumptive. 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 Yeah. 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 Who yeah. did you work with? Did um, you have to have talk to pharmacy or ID or who? Yeah. So we worked with our infectious disease pharmacy at the time. You know, it was actually something that they asked if we were willing to remove, you know, after I think it was uh, maybe a year or so or less into running the test. Um, so it's certainly it was a collaborative effort. Um, I don't think that this is uh, any of these molecular tests, especially that are coming out. I think it's definitely important to to really make it multidisciplinary and involve as many of the teams, especially antimicrobial stewardship and um, infectious disease. Thank you. Uh, Trish, you, you touched on this a few minutes ago, um, but let's come back to it and, and get into it a little bit more. Can you compare the accuracy of the currently available genotypic tests for gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria? Yeah. Um, so in general, for gram-positive organisms, one or two resistance mechanisms account for most clinically significant resistance on currently available molecular panels, such as MECA uh, for predicting methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or VAN-A and or VAN-B to, to predict vancomycin-resistant enterococci. And the accuracies of predicting susceptibility in gram-positives um, are actually quite high, above 90%, approaching 100% in certain publications. And that that's because there's generally just that one mechanism that can be used to predict both uh, resistance when present or um, susceptibility when absent, kind of what Jen was alluding to um, about the uh, the lack of MECA, you can report it out as methicillin, resist uh, methicillin susceptible uh, staph aureus. Mm -hmm. Now, thinking about the gram-negative side, that becomes a lot more complex for predicting antimicrobial susceptibility testing because their mechanisms, there's so many mechanisms that can mediate the same phenotype. And so it's um, so there it results in lower accuracies of prediction, especially for predicting susceptibility. 
For that reason, at Johns Hopkins, from our gram-negative panel, we choose to only report the AMR genes when present uh, and not to report them when they're absent. Um, so, um, for example, the lack of detection of the ESBL gene, CTXM, does not guarantee that an organism is going to be susceptible to the third generation cephalosporins, as there are many different off-panel targets, as I was alluding to earlier, that can also result in third generation cephalosporin resistance, such as other ESBL genes that are not targeted, um, inducible AMPC or acquired AMPC, et cetera. And so we don't want to tell the clinician on the gram negative side that CTXM isn't present and them think, oh, then, then this isolate is definitely going to be third generation cephalosporin uh, susceptible because of the absence. And so for that reason, we'll only report when detected so that they, when it's detected, they assume it's resistant. When it, when we don't say anything about it, we don't, when it's not detected, we don't say anything about it so that they can't so they're not making any hypothesis as to the susceptibility of the isolate based off the absence of those resistance genes in the gram negatives. Thank you. So Jen, why should laboratories try to reconcile the discrepant susceptibility results from phenotypic and genotypic tests? Why don't we just report everything and let people sort it out? Um, yes, that's a good question because, you know, it's it's a lot more work for clinical labs to be doing this. I mean, ultimately, you know, genotypic testing in general, you know, it's an it's an additional test for labs. And I think the fact that so many labs are dedicated to doing this really speaks for why it's important. Um, but so let me just so I'll summarize two scenarios for when discrepancies can be encountered, similar to what Trish said. One is if you detect a resistance gene in an isolate, but it's phenotypically susceptible. And then vice versa, where you have the absence of the gene um, when the isolate is found to be resistant. Um, the latter would be uh, similar to what you would call a very major error, for example, where you know, you're know you assuming it's susceptible based on genotypic, but then it turns out to be resistant. Um, these discrepancies is really de can be detrimental to the patient when you think about it as it can lead to inappropriate de-escalation of antimicrobials, or on the other hand, unnecessary escalation to a broad spectrum therapy. So with that, it's, it is extremely important that labs do reconcile these discrepant results. Um, it's ultimately good lab practice. It ensures that we are providing the most accurate data to um, appropriately manage patients. Um, for discrepancy investigation, it is also required for laboratories that are CAP accredited. There was a new checklist that was released in 2019 that indicates that lab must link their antimicrobial indeter resistant determinants um, with the phenotypic susceptibility results to that particular organism. And so with that, it's expected that labs also have a written protocol to describe how they will troubleshoot such a process. And then finally, you know, I think what's really important is that providers can easily lose faith in a test. You know, you, you can get it 99 times right out of the 100, but they will always remember that one time when you didn't get it right. So with that, it's important to really develop like a consistent approach to resolve these discordant dis results, um, to, to have a clear reporting structure and to effectively communicate with them so that they don't lose trust in the test and, and really understand what might have gone wrong. Thank you. And I think your point about trust is a very is a very good one. We've all had that unpleasant experience where we have a flawed report and it leads to um, understandable concern in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. yes. So we, we understand the different types of tests. We understand the discrepancies and where they may come from. Let's start to get into the details of how labs should actually hand, handle these. So Trish, there's a really nice figure in the paper that shows the initial steps labs can take when they're looking into discrepant results. Can you give us an overview of that? Yeah, for sure. So that was a figure that Dr. Yi had put together. And um, I really like it because it kind of gives you an overview of how to approach an the initial discrepance. But I think it's important before you get to that point to initially weigh the need of additional testing as repeat testing will cause delays of reporting, adds additional costs, and may not always resolve your discrepant results. So if the discrepant results can be rationalized through an alternative explanation, such as 
as an off-panel mechanism of antimicrobial resistance, uh, resulting in phenotypic resistance, then further testing is often not required. So that's the first step. You really need to weigh, do I really need to do this or not? Then you need to piece together, if, you, if the results are unusual and can't be explained otherwise, then additional troubleshooting is often required. And as uh, Jen pointed out, it's good laboratory practice. Um, and having a good SOP for your text to follow uh, um, in those scenarios is extremely helpful as well. And so figure one really kind of describes the general workflow and basic steps in, in initiating the troubleshooting um, uh, process. And this kind of goes back to, as I had mentioned, kind of the four categories that may result in discrepant results. So, you know, your cultured growth. So you want to go and check your purity plates. You want to, if, if it's mixed, you want to test the individual isolates. Um, you want to confirm the isolate identification, followed by repeat AST. And if you're repeating your phenotypic ASTs, you might want to try a, an alternative method or ideally a reference method to confirm those results. Um, then you want to look, you also want to start to investigate into any reagent or instrument issues, check which module or instrument the positive sample was run on, um, check your lot numbers of blood culture uh, bottles, reagents, and reagents used for testing to try to trend for any uh, nucleic acid contamination events. Um, you want to check your expiration dates. And I always find it very helpful when we encounter um, some of these discordances to get the diagnostic company involved. Oftentimes, we can't tell the amplification curves or the cutoffs because it's locked in their FDA cleared system. Uh, but on the on the diagnostic end side, they can pull those results and give you a little bit more information. Oh, that just was like a blip above the threshold that we really believe this is a false positive result. So I think working with the with the company is is always very helpful and both the company and the labs benefit from that relationship in the troubleshooting process and then again you also want to look at reporting as I mentioned you could have clerical issues especially if you're not if it's not interface to your LIS you can you know transcription issues and so you want to make sure you go back to the reports and check was was that truly the results that we meant to input into the patient chart um, and uh, make sure that that's not what's causing the discrepant just due to a transcriptional error or something. Um, and then also, I always find it helpful to look at um, the patient's past results. Have they had a history of resistance organism? Have they had a history of an unusual AST associated with that resistance um, organism being detected? Um, so I think all of those things need to be kind of pulled together to start to initiate your troubleshooting with discrepant results. And if none of these yield a, a you know, an answer, then I think you need to dive in deeper into the mechanistic based um, uh, scenarios, which uh, Jen and I will uh, follow up on in uh, future questions. So Trish, you mentioned this and let's go ahead and get into it. You uh, included recommendations for specific groups of organisms. And let's take a look at a couple of those. Can you take us through the recommendations for reconciling genotypic and phenotypic testing uh, results when staph aureus is detected by a nucleic acid amplified test? So this is when a, uh, for staph aureus, when a MEK gene is detected by the molecular panel, but an isolate is confirmed to be either cefoxitin or oxacillin susceptible, or vice versa, when MEK is not detected, but cefoxitin or oxacillin is resistant. So Trish really nicely summarized the discrepancy investigation earlier, which would include, you know, always confirming, for example, that there isn't a mixed culture, that you don't have a coagulate staff mixed in there or something that could explain the discrepancy. Um, and so assuming that this isn't the case, the other thing would be to confirm the identification, make sure that it really is a staff aureus. Um, other steps would be to repeat the phenotypic susceptibility result or um, even a PBP2A assay. And if available, you can also consider performing the MECA PCR directly from the colony. Other things to double check would be to make sure that you are using the correct breakpoint, um, you know, that you're using the staph aureus breakpoint and not the staphylococcus breakpoint. And I'm, you know, embarrassed to say that this has happened to us um, a few times on our Phoenix instrument where they automatically go to the staph species breakpoint. 
Um, some isolates may also have uh, cefoxetine-induced expression of PBP2A. And in those cases, you know, we could, you would even consider subculturing the organism from the blood bottle, placing this, the cefoxetine disc right in the first quadrant. And that could help you identify a more resistant population. And so with that, you can repeat the cefox, um, repeat tests by just collecting some, the growth from the cefoxetine zone margin to see if that helps resolve the issue as well. But overall, in any, if any of the discrepancies is not resolved, which happens, um, you, we ultimately want to err on the side of caution and report the isolate as resistant as recommended. Thank you. Trish, you also have recommendations for various scenarios with gram-negative organisms. Can you describe the recommendations when a carbapenemase gene is detected? Yes, of course. Carbapenemases are my favorite. So <laughs> I am more than happy to take this one on. So again, coming back to the two scenarios, um, the first scenario in your discrepancy could be that you have uh, no detection or the lack of detection of a carbapenemase gene, but phenotypically you're detecting resistance to the carbapenems. And so the mi most likely scenario is an off-panel AMR mechanism. So again, it could be a carbapenemase that isn't targeted by the panel, or it can be a combination of ESBL, AMP-C, combined with um, permeability defects resulting in the phenotypic um, susceptibility, uh, phenotypic resistance uh, results. And so with that, you know, this, this is again a scenario that I think labs most likely don't need to do anything further because you can rationalize why this discrepancy is going on. And so the labs don't often need to do any further testing, except for let's say the AST profile is really wonky. It's susceptible to penicillin and cephalosporins, but resistant to carbapenems. Then you should be considering repeating your phenotypic AST because something's weird going on there. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, you know, these are pretty straightforward. The labs don't need to do additional testing and they should report the results as tested initially. Um, in, on the flip side, this is when it gets a lot more complicated and there's a lot, many different scenarios that can result in a carbapenemase gene being detected, but your phenotype, it's susceptible to the carbapenems. So at this point, you know, there's many different possibilities that might be causing this. You could have the lack of or poor expression of that carbapenemase gene, um, a heteroresistant population, the loss of the plasmid that carries that gene on subculture in the absence of selective pressure. And so in these scenarios, um, there are many steps that you wanna take. The first step we take in our lab, anytime we detect a resistant mechanism in gram negatives is we actually throw down a disc to, uh, to provide selective pressure. So if an ESBL gene is detected, we put a cephalosporin disc. If a carbapenemase gene is detected, we put down a carbapenem disc. Because we found that when we were seeing discrepancies, that was one of the things, we'd always go back to the bottle and place a disc to put the selective pressure on there to try to isolate that resistant subpopulation or resistant bug from that bottle. And so instead of delaying it with our discrepant, we do it all the time now as one of our steps. Um, so you want to sub that blood culture broth with a carbapenem disc. If a carbapenemase gene is detected, it's phenotypically susceptible. Our first step would be to sub it with the disc to try to select for that resistance population to see if we could detect it. And then if, if you, um, if you still don't see it, you want to pursue additional testing. You could take a swipe test directly from that plate that you subbed out and use a, another molecular test like the Carba R assay. And if you're still detecting that resistance gene, then you know, well, the gene's there, um, what is going on? So at that point, you might want to use another phenotypic test to see if it's being, if the carbapenemase gene is being expressed or not. So you're just detecting, detecting the presence of a gene. The next step is to see if it's being expressed or not. So you can use a phenotypic uh, carbapenemase test like the modified carbapenem inactivation method or the carba NP test to broadly detect carbapenemases. Or alternatively, you could use one of the lateral flow amino assays like the carba 5 test that would detect the enzyme being 
expressed from that gene, um, from the cultured growth to see if it's truly being expressed or not. Um, and then, so that's from the molecular standpoint to try to parse that out. But you also want to look on your phenotypic susceptibility testing. You want to make sure to repeat there, see if there's, um, use an alternative method, preferably a reference method, uh, to try to see if you can, um, if there's any issues from that side of things as well. Ultimately, if things don't resolve, as as Jen had alluded to, you want to err on the side of caution, and you want you would report um, your carbapenems as resistant if you're de if you're still detecting that resistance gene. Um, so if you think it's present, there you know there's the possibility of it being induced or you know expressed at a higher uh, concentration with selective pressures of therapy. And so I think it's important um, uh, to let the the clinicians know it's present, even though phenotypically. Um, you're not able to show the phenotype of it, um, but to let them know that it's there either by forcing your, your carbapenems resistant or what we do at our institution is we report the phenotype, phenotype to genotype discrepancy, but add a comment in there to contact the lab or the infectious disease team for further information if um, to follow up on this. Thank you, Trish. I, I want to go back to something you mentioned, and that is when a carbapenemase gene is present, yeah. but the organism appears to be susceptible, yeah. you'll go back to the original sample, the blood culture bottle, uh, for example, sub that with an appropriate disc. And then what do you do with that? What do you look for after that's incubated? Yeah, so we're not, you know, we're not interpreting AST results. We're just trying to, you're going to take the growth from around the, the zone uh, in proximity to the disc uh, to try to identify the subpopulation that uh, that contains that resistant gene. And then you could reset up your AST results from that or set up additional testing like the CARBA-5 or M-SIM directly from around that disc to allow for the selective pressure um, to hopefully not result in the loss of the resistance mechanism or to select for that resistant subpopulation if present. Got it. Thank you. Jen, it may be confusing to the clinical staff to see susceptibility results that change over time as the lab investigates discrepant results. How can clinical microbiologists work with other teams, antimicrobial stewardship, infectious diseases, and pharmacy to make sure that the results are being interpreted and applied correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that so I think that's a really important point is just to really have that communication between microbiologists and the healthcare providers, particularly the ASP group or the infectious disease team. Um, and this is just to maximize the benefit of the test result in general from the context of the patient. So, for example, generating appropriate comments that will allow the providers to easily interpret the result that you're offering. Um, I think the other point to make is just the fact that clinical microbiologists in general are, you know, just experts in the areas of molecular and antimicrobial resistance and to work with those teams as well to offer the continuous education and to disseminate the appropriate information to them, you know, increasing that visibility of the microbiologist that allows for proactive consultation is important. And, you know, so that, that they, they know you're there, that they can easily ask a question. Um, and often this can be through liaison with ASP or the infectious disease team. Um, when there is a, a, a dis discrepancy that needs to be investigated, I think it's important to be, you know, just to have open and continuous communication between us and ASP and infectious disease. You know, as soon as the discrepancy is identified, you know, it may be necessary to kind of communicate with them but what is what I think is important, though, is that each situation is different and when to amend a report in the medical record versus when not to while you're investigating really depends on what's happening. Um, you know, for example, if you have an MRSA that is being reported that turns out to be phenotypically susceptible um, to oxycillin or sofoxetin, I would I wouldn't necessarily adjust the report while the investigation is underway, if anything you know, you're, you're investigating it on the side, but I would maintain the fact that it's an MRSA in the report. Um, because in the end, even if it's not resolved, you're going to end up reporting out or maintaining the fact that it is an MRSA. So overall, just I think, um, but for example, on the other hand, if you have like a, an MSSA that was 
that was reported based on genotypic testing that was found to be resistant. I think that's when it would be really important to promptly notify the primary team, modify the report, and then work with the antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist or infectious disease to who, who can hopefully help or even, you know, further discuss the case with the primary team, explain the changes as to why it happened and offer their recommendations when appropriate, um, just to kind of decrease the, the confusion that can happen if this happens often. And hopefully, and usually it, it doesn't. Thank you, Jen. Uh, this has really been a lot of fun and really interesting. If you were staying tuned to see if there was a game, I didn't have one time to write one this morning. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was so <laughs> nervous. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> that's, the, that's the part that gets me. I'm like, that's where I'm going to make a fool out of myself. I <laughs> wish <I'd be> <laughs> well, I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> Thank you both, Trish and Jen. This has really been a lot of fun. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. You can find the paper we discussed under the Accepted Manuscripts tab at jcm.asm.org. Thanks for listening.